So what we're going to do is I'm going to give the mic to them and have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about the work that they do. Good afternoon. Say Lorenzo begins. She had a lot of things that she had to do with the English language. I started, I should say we started, when you first come in, you're going to see our booth there to the right. Uh, my sister, Laverne Begay Todicini, is also my business partner. She's also my project director for our nonprofit. So I'll be going back to the R4 Business, which is uh, the London Professional Business Consulting Services, LLC. We, five years ago, we started a nonprofit called the Net Community Development Corporation. Uh, so we go back, we bounce back and forth, and we're going to be talking about some of the programs that we develop to help our Navajos entrepreneurs, also our Navajo farmers and ranchers out there, uh, and also the fundings that we tapped into and some of the revenue and how we diversify our services to increase our revenue for the business side. So again, um, running a nonprofit is considered a business also too, and we have a lot of opportunities out there for our community, our the net community members. Uh, we also work with um, certified chapters. Currently, we're the fiscal manager uh, for Delcon chapter. We supervise our managed their um, USDA grant that we got for them. Uh, like most chapters, if you're not familiar with it, the LGA certified chapters can apply for funding on their own, so we assisted them with that project. This year, they're updating their land use plan, and as a certified chapter, you know that every five years you need to update your land use plan, so we'll be talking about more later. But um, our, my background is, uh, like most people, I, I went to boarding school, Chinle boarding school, from there, Carson Forms High School. Uh, my mom was the one that really encouraged us to go back to school, so we all trans, so I guess, uh, transitioned to NAU, where I got my bachelor's. Uh, my sister and I went further. We both got our master's in management from Phoenix, and I went one step further, and I got my PhD a couple years ago. So just call me Lorenzo. Hardly anybody knows I have a PhD. I don't call myself Dr. Begay, so Lorenzo's fine. Um, again, we'll be sharing our experiences, the good, the bad, the barriers, the plus, the negatives that exist out there in terms of operating your business. I've been with you there. My very first job was working for the Chin Lee Regional Business Development Office. Uh, and also uh, working with economic development all the way to um, operating our own nonprofit right now. So again, I'll be using some of these examples throughout my presentation. Thank you. Yad e shes warbaski little in shia, but ah nin shlo go kente chitni bashes chin zethlana deshche auto top on ha deshnele. I'm from Anith, Utah. Um, I a little bit of my background. Um, how, as it leads into my current role um, working with Kinship Lending and Change Labs is I worked for a bank um, in Durango, Colorado for Southwest Bank. It's a CDFI bank. And for those of you who don't know what CDFI is, it's a, they are a community development financial institution. And so the mission of the bank is, or their bank, is to target underserved communities um, like minority populations or women-owned businesses, things like that. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's a part of the bank side. And the other um, piece of that is um, they, they also have a sister nonprofit, uh, the First Southwest Community Fund. And so my role with both of those um, was working with startup uh, businesses in South Colorado. And so... Um, utilizing, you know, different loan products and uh, tools in our tool in their toolbox to provide access to capital. Um, as far as um, with the bank, you, you utilizing SBA loan products as well as USDA loan products, and then on the nonprofit side, um, there was about the time I was there, there was about like eight active loan funds there that I helped um, help them manage with um, with. Um, for for the to provide access to capital for businesses, and so that's a little bit of my background as far as like what what my expertise lies in and my um, uh, experience. And so now working with Change Labs, you know we're we're redefining what the five C's of credit are, and in doing so, we are able to tailor our loan program and um, the the kinship lending. Um, loan program and providing 
um, access to capital for Navajo and Hopi um, businesses in, in this region, the whole Navajo Nation region as well. And so, and there's also opportunity um, that's coming through Navajo Nation with the SSBCI funding that we are going to be expanding that um, to, to Navajos who live off the reservation as well. And so, um, that's a little bit of my background. So. Yate, she bre Isaac and she, Kiani Nishlankis, she in Bushinkis Anida Shiara Toba Nationale. Good afternoon. My name is Brett Isaac. I am the founder and executive chairman of Navajo Power. Uh, I also have a subsidiary that I'm a chairman for called Navajo Power Home, and I serve as a board chair for Change Lab. So, multiple, multiple hats that I've been wearing. Uh, I grew up in. Um, uh, up in a place called Baby Rocks. My mom is from a place called Baby Rocks. My dad um, is from the community of Shanto. And, um, <clears throat> you know, say my first job was holding a flashlight, you know, growing up on the res, like, you know, we, we resource a lot of different things, you know, and, and we learn them as we grow up. You know, I was operating equipment and fabricating heavy metal while I was in high school, you know, because we didn't have access to, you know, the stores. We didn't it, we weren't able to buy tools right away, we had to make them. Um, but that led to kind of me taking business, you know, with that same approach, which is essentially like looking at what we have and working with it and starting a company. Navajo Power is an energy developer, so we focus our work on tribal lands, developing some of the largest projects in the country. A lot of our projects are 200 megawatts and plus, our largest one is a 750 megawatt project out here in Coal Mine Canyon. Um, just for context, 750 megawatts would roughly power about like 250,000 homes, um, 4,500 acres, which is roughly three by three miles, you know, in size. So it's, you know, it's massive. It's billion. It's a over a billion dollar in economic activity. And the reason we got involved in that, I guess, you know, growing up in essentially a coal community, you know, I always knew that our economies were very fragile because of that. Our jobs were tied to one specific industry. And it, it was scary, you know. When the coal mine closed in um, Black Mesa and when the power plant shut down, a lot of my relatives lost jobs. They had to move. A lot of people moved out of the area, you know, and they saw a decline in services. And really that's when I got active in developing this company because we wanted to be at the forefront of developing the next version of energy. Part of the thing we see with the closure of coal is I don't see millionaires coming out of that industry. I don't see people that, you know, created a sustainable living. A lot of those people, even though they worked really hard, you know, never were able to ascend up the ladder. In Peabody Western, you didn't see Navajos at their executive level. You know, in Salt River Project, you don't see executives down in Phoenix that are Navajo. All of our energy companies were led by non-natives, non-Navajos. Even on our lands, NTUA, white guy, Intec, white guy, you know. Our own companies don't even put our own people in charge of them. So the only way to do something about that was to create my own. So Navajo Power, you know, we are kind of disruptive in that nature is that we entered into a market because we knew that we could be influential in it. We knew that with the right partnerships, we could build something. So the initiative of a startup is really taking a challenge and addressing it through networking and resourcing, which is part of why you guys are here today and why I'm here, is essentially this is how I started that company too, was I just went out, had an idea, and started meeting people, shaking their hands, saying, hey, maybe one day we'll work together. And it's come true to a lot of the people I have worked with that I've brought them into my company, we've done deals with them, we've brought them into partnerships, we've contracted them, like all that really worked out. And it's continuing to grow. We're only five years into our operation, but we've done quite a bit in capital raising. Out of the group here, I'm the, I'm the one that's kind of like the, um, you know, I, I've never been a part of an institution. You know, I've never worked as an employee for a government or for some structure. They wouldn't hire me. I guess my, <laughs> my credentials weren't good enough. Only one was Toys R Us. I worked at Toys R Us when I was in, in, in college. Um, I always say that my resume, if you go back in it, it's Toys R Us, Radio Shack, Hollywood Video. 
none of those companies exist anymore. So you can't, I'm like a ghost. I don't have no work history. All the companies I started are the ones that are, you know, that are ones that I created, you know. But I also did help the community of Shanto. Out of college, I helped them start the Shanto Economic Development Corporation, which created a gas station and is now building a hotel. Um, I helped the community work on their LGA initiative through advisement through a nonprofit. I sit on boards. I'm in, on the Board of Change Labs because I really believe that networking and all this stuff is meaningful. And so my participation here is also access, you know, to ask me questions about what it is I went through and the experiences because there's a lot of lessons out there and we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. For some reason, we're like potter make, pottery makers. We just destroy the thing and then try to build it all over again. We need templates. We need to build molds. We need examples that we can replicate. So that's, that's really the basis of why I'm here. I guess I'll turn it back before I talk too long. All right. Well, just a little bit about my background. I started my career in banking. Um, some of you out there know that I uh, worked as a branch manager for a bank in Kayenta, then Winslow, then Window Rock. And during my career, that was about 12 years of banking on or around the Navajo Nation, not once did I give a business loan to one of my Navajo customers. Not once was I able to approve credit cards for my Navajo business owners. The lack of access to capital is something that I've seen in my career. There are so many times that I had customers come into my branch, come sit down at my desk, and tell me their beautiful story of the business they wanted to start. They would tell me, this is what I want to do, and this is what I'm going to do. They had, they had everything they wanted to, to do in their head, and they, they said, I want to make this happen. But the first question I would ask them is, well, do you have two years of tax returns? No. Do you have a business license? No. And it was just so heartbreaking to turn people away and, and tell them, sorry, we can't do a loan for you because we need these documents in place. And I saw that over and over again. I took a job in Flagstaff and was a business banker in Flagstaff, and I did business loans. It was so easy for the businesses in Flagstaff to come into my branch, apply for the loan, use their business as collateral. Do, I was able to do $250,000 loans within just a couple of weeks and give this business owner access to capital. And from that point, I knew that I needed to do something that would be impactful in my communities. I knew that I needed to be able to do something besides working for this corporation who wasn't going to do anything to help my people. So I left the company that I was with for over 15 years, and I went back to school to finish my degree and got my degree in business administration and tried to look for work um, in, in the field of economic development. And I was lucky enough to go to Navajo Technical University. They were starting up an incubator there. And so I went and I was administrative assistant to the director of the incubator there for a couple of years. And then I went and worked for a chapter for a couple more years. And during my time at Navajo Technical University's incubator, I got to meet Jessica Stego and Heather Fleming, the co-founders of Change Labs. And boy, they opened my eyes to what can happen if we put our minds together, if we do things where we want to have an impact in our communities. So that's where I got connected to the folks at Change Labs. Um, I came to Change Labs full time in 2020 um, as a business coach. And, and the plan was to have me transition into the director of the, the uh, Kinship Lending Program. So I've been the director at Kinship Lending now. Um, we actually have lent out a total of 57 loans to entrepreneurs over the last three years. And these are small loans. They are uh, mainly $5,000 loans, mostly $5,000 loans. We did a couple of $10,000 loans to our incubator graduates. And so we do want to make it easier for entrepreneurs to gain access to capital. And so I'm really glad to be sitting up here with these three gentlemen 
uh, because I know that the work they are doing right now is having an impact in our communities. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and start with a, a, a question for each of them and then we'll get to a round where we can um, answer questions from the audience and then we'll go to a second round of questions. So this question is for Lorenzo. How, um, how do you go about addressing the lack of biz, small business and financial literacy programs that will improve entrepreneurs' vitality of applying for funding opportunities? How many participants in here are in business right now? Raise your hand. Okay, how many participants applied for any type of lending opportunities out there? Okay, one, which is very, very small. Okay, I'll get back. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples of how we work with entrepreneurs, um, the way we grew up on the Navajo Nation, and my mom's the one that, um, I guess, instilled some values into our family, saying that you go off the reservation, you come back, make sure that you give back to the Navajo Nation. And like most people, we went to Phoenix, and uh, my mom was having problems, so we transitioned back to the Navajo Nation where we started. Uh, I've always had an interest in um, economic development and entrepreneurship. Uh, my PhD is in economic development. Uh, I work with Navajo Nation for the last 25 years in and out of different programs. Like I work for the NHA Housing. We did the Southwest Business Cabin as an economic development uh, project. Uh, we work with uh, my first, our first contract with Navajo Nation under Salina Professional Business Consultant was with the uh, Department of Economic Development. I've always used to say that economic development are always selective in terms of, not very selective, but only had a couple of individuals, none Navajo, mind you, working and doing consulting work, whether it's feasibility study, business plan, et cetera. So they always work with Southwest Business, Michael Peacock out of Albuquerque. So we were approached and um, I said, no, I don't think so, I'm not gonna waste my time because doing a proposal, do, responding to an RF um, request for proposal is time consuming. It's like applying for a job. Most of you guys know that uh, the procurement process, you know, you update your resume, you do your scope of work, the methodology and all this thing. And so two weeks before it's due, she calls me again. Uh, this is Charlene Begay Batero the person that masterminded the Navajo Nation uh, first incubator project at Church Rock, New Mexico, which is currently operated on, by the Navajo Tech, it's called Navajo Tech Innovation Center, operated by NT, NTU, yes. So they operated, but it's in Church Rock, right past the casino. If you don't know about it, go over there. So the whole idea behind the incubator, again, is the concept of having a little chicken and an egg, and it graduates like after three years or so, but we've been there for like, I think five years now. So anyway, get, uh, we got this contract with Navajo Nation. That was our very first contract. Being a, the small business on Navajo Nation, you know about the Business Opportunity Act. How many of you guys got contracts based on that? Uh, a lot of us haven't, you know, it's just a program. A lot of these programs that we do have with Navajo Nation, I was hoping the division director would be here also too because I do have high hopes in terms of them addressing some of the economic small business development needs on Navajo Nation. One is the um, Navajo um, the Procurement Act. It's really outdated, and do people follow it? I don't. I highly doubt it. Doubt it. I'm also on the board with the with NAPI, uh, Navajo Agricultural Product Industry, and as a board member, I asked them how much of this how contracts are given to Navajos or Native Americans, how many are given to non-natives. And uh, they quote like 78 percent goes to non-natives, and we're talking about million dollars of contract. I'm like, what's happening with our own people? I've always been very passionate that we have Navajos on the reservation that can do equally, if not better, than our non-native counterparts. There's, a, I think people see the non-natives more professional or more high qualified, but when you look at it, you know, people in the Navajo Nation, we're very creative, we're very highly educated, we're highly experienced, we know the culture, we know the value, we know the language. We tell our clients that we grew up on the Navajo Nation, we're not one that comes for a two, three week project and disappear. We live with you because we have our home, home site lease on the reservation, we move back. As a matter of fact, we're establishing our office right there, right where we live. So again, we, we have a different, I guess, value when it comes to working with our own, uh, with our own tribal, um, I guess, our people, the enterprise we work with, the nonprofit, and even our clients. 
So again, um, addressing the small business, I've always known that it was really hard for small business to get in a loan. So what we did was um, we work, uh, my sister and I, we work, we always said that giving back, so of course we want to do a nonprofit, a nonprofit in the Navajo Nation. We got incorporated five years ago. This was an idea we kicked around for 15 years. And then so we're like, okay, we want to do a community development corporation. Uh, so that way, when we were out there in the community working with uh, a lot of chapters, they always ask, can you do this for us? Can you do a business plan for us? Can you update our land use plan? Can you do small business um, lending or um, financial literacy out there for us? But it does cost money. So this way, we apply for a grant. Then we go into the community and offer free small business um, workshops. So we, we created the, the Net Community Development Corporation for the whole Navajo Nation. We got incorpor incorporated under the Navajo Nation Business Regulatory Office. And then a lot of people will tell you or advise you, you go to the state, we're like, no, we're a sovereign nation. I went straight to IRS and they issue us our 501c3 letter of determination, which cost me like $10 to get incorporated in Navajo Nation. Of course, getting incorporated IRS is like 600. You know, so again, a lot of people spend money because they don't understand that you can, or we can go to our own Navajo Nation Business Regulatory Office. About a month ago, as part of our, uh, we call it the NEST CDC, uh, we actually had a nonprofit, uh, the NEST uh, nonprofit development training here at Twin Arrow. We had like 15 participants. All of our workshops are free. So that's why we incorporated the financial literacy part of it. If you read a lot of the research that Harvard has done, or OISA has done, or Nalbin has done across the nation, they will tell you that we need financial literacy, not only with the adults for the small business owners, but also with the youth. Therefore, uh, my sister and I, we got uh, certified as instructor for the Indian Pendurship Program. It's a small business, kind of like the SB, uh, SBDC, they have different curriculums, but I wanted one that will work with Navajo Nation, one that is based on Native American culture and examples, so that one worked, so we brought that to Navajo Nation. We went further. Uh, a lot of times we do get incorporated, but the trainings are off the reservation, or certified, I say, they're off the reservation. We pay for that because to us, that's an investment. So we went off and we got certified under the, um, I think it's the OISTA, what they call it, the Fen um, Building Native Communities Financial Literacy Program. So we had that one. Then we did the, um, the youth, again, financial literacy. We got certified under there, and then we also got certified with the agribusiness um, business program also too. So bringing these programs back, so address lending in that sense, uh, we like, okay, we had the small business lending program because what the first thing they'll ask you to do, where's your business plan? And you're right, a lot of people don't, have, uh, I mean, you go to the RBDO, no, no offense about RBDO, but they don't have the time to sit down with you. They give you a checklist. I've seen that checklist time after time, people come to us, this is what they gave us. I said, okay. That they explain what your primary research is, your secondary research, where is your uh, target market, what's your channeling, you know. A lot of this stuff uh, we have to, uh, we cover in our small business session. So again, uh, getting these programs available and at uh, no cost to our Navajo community was our number one priority, which we accomplished. Um, again, the, the program I'm talking about right now went further. So working with Navajo Nation, what's lacking uh, besides Change Lab? Navajo Nation does not, act, does not have an active uh, loan program. Uh, you heard about the Navajo Nation Business Industrial Fund. They call it BDB, BIDF. No, that's been changing. So has their micro lending program. This is what we're talking about, maybe six, seven years right now. It's like, where's our... Where is our Navajo entrepreneur supposed to go now without these programs? Again, um, I heard a lot of these recipients never paid back. I said, go after them. If it was a grant, it would have been a grant. You know, Nobody did their due diligence. So again, it's sitting at economic development and nothing has been done to this point. So we created our revolving loan fund program. We went after USDA funding. We got awarded. So we developed a program, but I didn't want to duplicate what Navajo Nation has done. Um, being out there in the community, working for the city of Chicago, uh, working down in Phoenix with uh, the, the lending programs out there, uh, the peer lending concepts seem to have worked. 
we were, uh, we researched the third world lending programs and the borrow circles, they call it. A bunch of uh, 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 women that are uh, making baskets, for example, they create a borrow circle. They all work together. So we created our Dene uh, revolving loan fund based on that. So we just recently um, awarded 10 individuals from 500 all the way to 1,000. Um, we awarded a, the Dene Agricultural Cooperative. Some of you have attended a Bidji Bob session, but you know, we, do, we did award 10,000 uh, to that cooperative, all the way down to we have a person that makes baskets that um, does gift wrapping. So again, entrepreneurship come in different forms. And agriculture, you know, we have our farmer and ranchers out there. What they do is also consider entrepreneurial. So we created the, the Netpreneurship Program, which is equivalent to the, your Small Business Development Center or your RBDOs. We got funded through the USDA World Business Development Grant. We took it a step further because uh, we wanted to work with our Navajo farmers and ranchers. So under the Native American Agriculture Fund, we developed the Dene Agribusiness uh, and Financial Assistant Program, which again are free for our Navajo individual community members out there. Uh, we also developed the um, Agribusiness um, Resource Manual, which has funding, certification, it has marketing, it has, mem it has cooperative development information on us free online. I think it's the first of its kind for Navajo Nation. Instead of researching, we're gonna have to go for a nonprofit, you know? You have this huge business resource that took me like over almost a year to develop, you know, pulling information, getting the websites, getting their description, getting their Facebook, they have it all the way down to different type of, um, they have Instagram, all the information we update it, and we provide that free of charge. So you just go to our website, it's at the nestcdc.org, and you can download that. You can also download our revolving loan fund program also, that's available online. Again, we're gonna be doing a, a couple of, um, I think we're gonna do 10 more within a couple of months. So again, um, we just finished our last small business development workshop last week too at the uh, Intech, uh, the incubator site. Again, we have graduated over 200 right now in our financial literacy and also our entrepreneurship uh, small business workshop. So again, there's a lot of resources out there that's available to you. A lot of them are free, and I tell people, look into some of these uh, resources because if you come to our for business side, individuals say, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. I say, I'm sorry, it's, uh, we're gonna charge you a lot because you know that's for the for-profit part of it. But if you come under our nonprofit, we're not gonna charge you at all. So all we ask you is just to go online and register, tell us what your needs are. Um, there's gonna be an intake form that will identify whether it's for nonprofit, whether it's for funding, whether it's for business plan development. So these are some of the services we do offer. Um, again, we base this on our experience working with Navajo Nation, the lack of resource they have, the lack of programs that will help not only our entrepreneurs, but also our farmer and ranchers. I'm taking it a step further where I'm gonna be submitting a grant for our Navajo farmers and ranchers for their loan program and also hopefully a partially grant program for them. Um, you hear a lot of small business owners come and they say, oh, we want a grant. I'm like, oh, well, good luck. You know, you don't see grants for small business for startups. And I'm hoping that um, I just saw something on Facebook by the chief of staff. And at the end, he was saying some of the improvements to be made, which really caught my eye was small business grants. So I'm hoping to get more information if they're going to make that available to our Navajo entrepreneurs out there. But again, it's about, you know, Funding, knowing these programs that exist out there, you know, start off small. We tell our entrepreneurs, you know, it's like building your credit, you know, do a $500 loan, you go from there, you increase it over time. So again, you know, these are some of the programs that we did for our for-profit and our nonprofit that are available for our Navajo community members out there, that how we address lending programs, how lend, are identifying and applying for lending opportunities. Hopefully I covered that. Thank you for that, Lorenzo. Next question I have is for, for Svavarsky. Um, what is a problem or a hurdle that you've seen startups face when they have applied for a loan with you, and how did they overcome that? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, um, so when you're working with startup companies, um, 
there's a, there's a variety of different things that, you know, that, that a lot of small businesses, especially startups, face. In the beginning, you know, when they're, when, there's, when they're in the beginning phases of running their business. And so the one that I kind of like, the one, the one there's, a, there's, there's a few stories that I have. So the one that I remember the most is about cr your credit history. And so when you go to a bank, you know, they look at your credit history. And so that, that's one part, that's one part of the five C's of credit that, a, that traditional lending practices evaluate is your credit worthiness, your character. And so the person that we worked with, um, they, um, they wanted to start this business, it was for cleaning services. And they, when we, when we pulled their credit, they had like, I think like 12, 12 charge-offs, things, you know, like when you're looking at, and the, the hurdle was to, you know, try to get them to the next step in running their business. And so the, fir the first thing that you do, I say this <laughs> a lot too, is um, with a financial institution like loan lenders, is you want to, if you're a good financial institution like lender, you want your, your, um, your borrowers, the people that you're making these relationships with, you want them to succeed. And so, and you want to set them up for success. And, and so with, with, you know, and, and life happens too. And we know that, you know, and for anyone who has worked, you know, in financial institutions, we know that life happens and there, there, there might've been an obstacle where, you know, where, where there's this huge thing that happens in your life and it impacts everything, including your ability to pay back loans that you took out. And so, you know, going through all of these obstacles with this borrower and through, you know, like, I call it credit counseling, and um, that's something that we're doing with Change Labs as well, is, you know, I think um, the idea of going through your credit history and what your credit report looks like should be something that you're, like, everyone should be comfortable about. I think it's... Um, I, I feel like a lot of people might feel ashamed and, you know, they, they want to keep it as, you know, they just want to, they don't want anyone to know. But I think if you're more open and you're ready to, like, sit down and, you know, fix this issue head on, it will make a difference in your life. I really, because there's a lot of things that in, the, in, in this Western society that tie back to that. It doesn't just stop here at, you know, your business loan. It could be play a role when you're going to be getting a mortgage loan, or if you need to get a car loan. You know, the, it plays a lot in, like, especially for like if you're, you know, what your interest rate's going to be. You know, you, you could get a high interest rate because your credit history isn't so great looking. And so, you know, so that's, you know, and so working with this borrower um, in identifying you know, what they needed to do to get over, you know, to get through this, we were able to get all of that taken care of and then give them a loan, knowing that, you know, what, and, and them giving explanations as to how they, um, all the life things that, that they went through, and then taking this new step in this new direction um, with creating this business. And, and when I left, they, they were still doing great. They were expanding, they were hiring people, you know? And so it's, um, so there's a lot of, you know, I see it as an opportunity and um, it should, you should never be af ashamed <laughs> um, of, of trying to fix that. And I think, um, and that could open a lot of doors for your business, especially if you're wanting to scale in, in, a, in a manner that, you know, that is just really hot, you have high expectations and high, you know, high achieving, you know, like uh, mentality, you know, and that's, and I feel like that's a lot in Navajo. Pe there's people in Navajo who have that. And, you know, I think, you know, and, and, and just, you know, and just, and really like going forward with um, getting this, uh, you know, addressing the, w some of those issues like that, you, you can really create a future for yourself and really achieve those goals. And I've, 
I have a strong um, opinion about like, or at least I think Navajo people, Native American people have the capability and we have the, um, the, the ability to do that. We've always had that. And so with kinship lending, we, um, in Change Labs, is we're, cha you know, we're, we're creating this, this perspective and this worldview of Native American worldview and, and really, re, re, not redefining, but we're kind of pivoting you know, into how we can really address these issues with our Native counterparts, our members, people in our community. And that's, you know, that's kind of, I just wanted to give, you know, like how, about one, one instance of, of how, like how powerful that can be. And so, and, and the other thing too is, you know, because when you give this loan, you want, you know, you want to have your, who you're, who you're working with, you're the person that you're having this really professional relationship with, you want them to succeed. You want, you want them to, you want, them, you want to set them up for success. And so that's one of the ways you can do that. And I think that's responsible as being a financial you know, lender in that aspect. OK, the next question is for Brett. Um, what steps can a startup take to gain access to new forms of capital? And how can that startup continually look for funding as they grow their business? You know, like <clears throat> the um, the concept of like getting access to capital, especially start startups in general. Like all of us, I guess you can say most of us are business people to, to some degree. You know, I mean, starting from the kid who sells baked goods, you know, at, at a sale all the way up to someone who's running, you know, a huge company. You have different needs, different, you know, levels of capital that you need to raise. One of the reasons we started a solar company is the barrier to entry was kind of low. I didn't need a billion dollars to get going, but I did need a significant amount. There's these scales and access that, you know, are usually prohibitive, and the, these two gentlemen definitely mentioned a bunch of them. I faced all of those growing up. It's like, you know, getting in the room is one of the hardest things to do. And we don't have very many friends that are of substantial wealth. You know, when you go outside the world, they call their buddies and say, I got this venture. Hey, you should invest in it. And their buddy has the money to do that. We don't have that for some reason, even in our own communities. We also don't crowdsource like we probably could, you know, I want to get us to that level to where it's our own people lending to ourselves because we're still reliant on outside institutions. We still haven't create, created that generational wealth. So for startups now, what we've managed to do at Navajo Power is we created a story around our formation and around our existence. Why do we exist? What, what do we do as a business? We're more than just an energy developer. Anyone can put solar panels on the ground. Anyone can do the electrical work. That's, that's pretty easy stuff. But can you change and transition communities? That narrative that we begin to build, I always say the first amount of money we raised, we were like religious prophets because there was no product. I couldn't show you what I could build. It was an idea we were selling. And we had to convince a lot of people to put money that they were in control of into that idea. That takes a lot of skill. you know. Developing your storytelling, developing your ability to tell your story better, to put pictures and to put a narrative in people's heads. Because when they invest, they're investing not just in the product. Again, if it was a product, you go to a bank, show them a patent, and they'd invest in that. A lot of our initiatives are game-changing to our families, to our communities, and to the livelihood of people we support. So that itself is actually valuable. It just hasn't been productized. And so what we did in Apple Power is we created product around that. We branded ourselves in a certain way. We talked about ourselves in a certain way. And when we got in front of investors, we looked at investors that had the same mentality, the same mission. They wanted to serve communities that were distressed economically, that had you know ambition to change the dynamics of households that wanted to get into the indigenous sphere. 
Because there's a lot of people that claim that. They'll put that on their websites. They'll put that on their platforms, their initiatives. But where's their money? Where does it go? You need pilots and projects. You need things that are investable. You need companies. You know, entrepreneurship is more than just saying I do something, putting CEO on a card and say, look, I'm a CEO. Again, we can all do that. But can you do it and tell a story that compels people to follow it? Can you provide that leadership? Because that's really what it boils down to, is you got to lead your initiative through the gauntlet of challenges for businesses. And so that's investors. You can go to traditional institutions like banks and say, I have this thing. You can put up a business plan or a slide deck and submit it to all these different things out there. Or you can hit these trade shows and pitch and pitch and pitch until somebody finally hears that. When we were first raising capital for my company, me and um, you know the other guy that I started a company was a, you know, one of my friends uh, is a Jewish kid from New Jersey. But he grew up you know, kind of very sustainably focused. And when he came to Navajo, just kind of really fell in love with everything that was going on here, wanted to be supportive. He brought the side I didn't know, which was he was able to go to Silicon Valley, start a billion dollar company, and then wanted to help me get something going, so he helped me with Navajo Power. He taught me how to get into those rooms, how to get in front of these investors, how to convince them, not just that they should invest, but they should continually invest, because that's what they do outside of this room. Outside of these walls, outside of our, our, our territory, those businesses, do you think Wells Fargo uses their own money to lend other people? No, they use yours. Like, they use somebody else's dollar. It's just capital moving around. I always use the example of, like, I've raised millions of dollars, but I've never seen a million dollars. I've never seen a physical, like, I've maybe seen it on a tally line or something. At the end of the day, it's scale. It's what it all is and how you tell that story. So as business owners and as startups, one of the best things that I really, like, want to carry forward is connecting people into that, that ecosystem. You know, I'm a conduit for you guys now. I'll say that. I know a lot of investors. We raised $10 million into a debt facility that we created. We went to the market, didn't see what we liked because it was too extractive. The interest rates were too high. They wanted a lot of control. Or we'd have to sell our soul and do something we didn't want to do. So instead, we used our influence and we used our story to say, this is what we want to do. This is how we want to do it. We created a debt facility. We set the terms. We want it to be a majority native-owned company. We want it to benefit communities. And we want to create a share that goes back to communities. And we challenge our investors to take concessionary capital. So instead of taking the 12% they would have gotten if they were a, a bank, we asked them to pick between one and three. The difference between that goes into a delta fund that, again, we created, we control. And what happens is that fund gets used to fund community initiatives. So we're using our ability to raise capital to also put capital back into communities. At maturity, that'll be a $5 million fund. So that's a $5 million fund that didn't exist that when we build our projects, repay our loan, is going to go back into the communities that we work with to fund things they want to do. I mean, that's how you can use capitalism to be a bit more you know, conscious of your social impact. It's how you recycle it back into communities and how you think about taking one step and making it as effective as it possibly can be. That debt facility, you know, was very unique of its time. And then you say, well, who would invest into that? It took us 35 investors to, to build it all out. But we did this during COVID. So we, <laughs> you know, in the beginning it was flying places, but then it became doing it over Zoom. I don't know how hard it is to hold a meeting over Zoom, but trying to tell this story and this narrative in a 45 minute window on your, on your cell phone or your, I mean, it, it seems nearly impossible, but we did it. You know, I got Starlink, I sat in my house in Baby Rocks, you know, told the sheep to be quiet while I was on the phone and just sold week, week after week, going to as many meetings as I could, doing diligence, doing all the answers. I built my team up with people that understood how to do this and were the very technical aspects, building models, handling questions. We have data rooms that if an investor is interested, we can give them a link and they can go through our entire company and then they will come back to us and say, okay, that's investable, what do you want to do? You know, that infrastructure is valuable because again, it's narrative. 
nothing in there is a product they're buying that, that says that they believe in the product. It's, it's a story. They're investing in your company because they don't believe that you're just going to do one thing. They're, they're believing you're going to do it multiple times over. So that's what I would always say is like that, that narrative of telling your story better as well as creating the infrastructure and peripherals so that an investor, whether they're an institution or a CDFI or something in between, or even just somebody really rich that wants to invest in your community, you gotta be ready to pitch them. You gotta be able to do it in a short amount of time. And then you gotta be serious enough to execute on that once it gets done. Because once that wave opens, it's amazing how much now I can walk into a room and just make these moves a lot quicker. You get better at it as you do it more and more. But you gotta start somewhere and that's always that first initial, you know, the first dollar you get is, is the start of what, whatever it is you can kind of push forward. But it's Well, thank you all for that. Now, I wanna see if anyone has a question. I'm gonna give uh, the next 10 minutes for questions. So does anyone out there have a question for the speakers here? I have a, a couple of questions maybe that you can answer for me. How is it that we come from a pastoral uh, society and we're trying to plug into a capitalist system? How is it that we're gonna make that transition from sheep camp to all these lights and business loans for what? Uh, right now, if anything, hay prices are at $28 a bale. Uh, nappies only got big bales. I don't know if they still have their water system. Um, that's a tribal enterprise, and we still can't get a bale of hay out here to Western Navajo. So uh, why is it that this enterprise isn't a co-op already? You know, they have the money, they have the water, they have the land, yet we're the owners. We're Navajo, the people. You guys own nappies, and you guys pay retail prices for your hay. Well, some white broker, now Navajo broker, comes in and buys it at retail and sells it back to make a profit. That's where we are as a people, and there's something major wrong here when I can't even borrow a dollar from the Navajo Nation or even the bank. I went over here to a bank and said, I want to borrow 20,000 for my company. They said, well, where's your collateral here? You don't have any loans? Of course I don't have any loans because I paid cash for everything. How am I supposed to have a credit history when I've never could borrow a dollar because of the color of my skin? I come over here and they say, no, where's your collateral? I say, well, I live on the reservation. We can't lend you money on the reservation. Well, what about my stock market? What about the commercial property I own in Manhattan? Okay, let's see your, let me see that paperwork. We can lend you money. I said, no, thank you. I'm out of here. And so we're trying to get money out there for a totally different lifestyle. Thank you. 
Would anyone like to answer that? Okay. There, there's a piece in there that I think really kind of touches the, the reason I started a company. Originally, I wanted to start a bank. Uh, part of the reason was I got frustrated with the system. I got frustrated that those same challenges, how do we get out of this? How does our economy change? And you trace it back and it goes to where our dollars come from. You know, the mechanism we use to resource our livelihoods, our homes, our family, all those things are not in our control. We don't have a vault somewhere where, that, where we pull out of it and, and we resource something. And that's what creating that generational wealth, but also creating some ability for us to have decision-making capabilities. You get federal funds, now all of a sudden, the feds are involved in every decision you make. You get a grant, there's the parameter around, oh, you can use it for this, but not for that. You know, There's always something that's a barrier. And we know that barrier, if it exists, it exists where we're trying, what we're trying to do and what it is we're, we're trying to accomplish. And so I think part of the challenge is like, we got to create these ventures to be bigger. You know, I, I've seen so many programs where they've offered like, you know, well, well, we can do this amount of money, but we can't do this. And it's like, it's right at that threshold where it's just not enough, you know. It's like right now, like we can't take calls for money that's below a certain amount because it's just not worth the legal work that we have to do. It's just so much work that goes involved in it. So how do we get out of that system? It's we got to be able to generate store and this, I guess, have our own banking system, have our own lending system, have our own capital so that when we fund something, it's peer to peer. The person who gave you the money is the one you asked for it. And they're the ones that give you that ability to say, do what you need to do with it. I just want to make sure that it has the same impact. So that's, that's my answer to that. Yes, so, um, okay, so to answer the question about, you know, the, you know, ver financial institutions and, you know, the, the current status that we're in for b the ability to borrow, I think um, that's where Change Labs comes in and that's, that's, and that's why kinship lending has been created, is to provide capital access for Native American entrepreneurs. And so the, 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 the style that we're, or at least the structure that we're working with is a relationship-based lending. And so we don't use like, we don't use general, regular lending practices or traditional lending practices. And so, um, and so, you know, like we could meet with you about, you know, what you need. And that's what me and, me and um, Christine's job is to do. And, um, but, and that's you know and, and to like the, like what um, just and just like what he was saying was you know we need to create or at least pivot in a way that we're able to identify you know solutions for for a lot of these issues that we're facing and so and that's what Change Labs is doing and that's kind of the work that we're involved with and so if you hear any of our panelists speak about you know or speak in any of the events to you know, today and tomorrow, you'll kind of hear kind of like the same, you know, answers or the same responses in how we're trying to address these. And it takes, it takes a, a, a village, really, like it takes a community, it takes a network. And so like all of us working together, every single organization here who is providing um, services or financial education, to our people, you know, it takes everybody working together to, to create these solutions and collaborating. And, and that's kind of why, you know, this event, this whole event was created, was to, was to find solutions and, you know, to talk about current issues in the status that we're in and trying to work, you know, work together and, and collaborating and, you know, like finding solutions as, as um as a community as an Navajo community I just want to make a, a couple of comments um, you hit on the word cooperative you know why does Navajo Nation have any big cooperatives out there the whole cooperative concept you know work in rural communities out in the United States why can't we bring it here Navajo Nation economic development you know their ideal 
of business development is another C store, another gas station, another laundromat. You know, those concepts are done with another tribal enterprise. You are right. Tribal enterprise actually competes with our entrepreneurs out there, especially if they don't give them any procurement opportunities, whether it's contracts that, you know, some of the small business, our Navajo small business owners um, can apply for. So there's a lot of opportunities out there that some, some of the tribal enterprise could be doing, but they're not doing it. Uh, I'm glad you hit on the nappy, you know. I, as a board member, I ask all these questions because I think NAV uh, NAPI is a good example of a tribal enterprise that's not given back to its own people. I ask them every year to have appreciation. Why is it always in New Mexico? Navajo Nation, I said, Navajo, NAPI belongs to the whole Navajo Nation. How can you go to hell, hell some of these events? in the ch like Chinle community, which I represent, the whole agency. How come you don't come out? How come you don't, they used to do, um, go into your community and sell, hey, why can't you do that anymore? I, when I was the chair, I made sure that happened. They used to haul hay out there, they say it costs some money. I said, you know what? These are our entrepreneurs that, these are some of the grandmas out there, you know, that can't afford to drive six, seven hours just to go to Nappy and back. You know, from Chinle, it takes me about three hours just to go to Nappy, get hay, and come right back. It's a wear and tear on my vehicle. It's time consuming. You know, there's a lot that's taken out of me just to get hay for my sheep. I have over 100 Navajo churro sheep at home right now. I hire a sitter, so I'll just take care of my sheep right now. But I do relate, you know, with what some of your concerns are because, again, some of these tribal enterprises need the right board members, and I'm hoping this new administration makes some of these changes. A lot of the board members need to be qualified. Unfortunately, some of the board members I sit with do not have the education or the background in terms of economic development. You know, um, they look at some of the potential opportunities that NAPI could do with the undeveloped acres that are just sitting there. Um, one of the projects that we work with under the um, our nonprofit is to develop viable projects for the Navajo Nation. I, uh, we are uh, really, really supportive of the whole cooperative. We did the um, artist cooperative for Navajo Nation. Navajo Arts and Craft was supposed to take that and work with our Navajo artists. If you're not really familiar with the whole co concept of cooperative, uh, let's just say everybody in here is a Navajo artist. We all get together and become like the Navajo Artist Cooperative. As members, you know, we're actually the owners of that cooperative. It works very well across America, but for some reason, you know, we work in silo, you know, ain't the guy, you know, we can't do that anymore. In order to thrive and be self-sufficient and become self-sustained out there, we need to reintroduce these cooperative concepts to the Navajo Nation. We've done the credit union cooperative. We spend about six months doing a feasibility study. We've done the surveys, we do the research. Uh, we literally do the uh, feasibility study and slash business plan. Try to hand it over to Navajo Nation to do something with it. They've been trying to do a Navajo bank for how long right now? I said, here's something that works. You know, you have the National Credit, uh, credit, called National credit um, Union Association that's willing to come to Navajo Nation to provide technical assistance, you know. But for some reason, nobody picks that up. As you see, it probably has another project. We do all the work for it. We apply for the grant, so we just literally hand it over. Nothing has been done yet until we did the, uh, we call it the Net Agriculture Cooperative. Finally, we got somewhere, so we got that incorporated under the Navajo Nation. They're actually applying for some fundings, and the lady that did the cooperative, Bijiba, she helped us. Um, she helped us with the membership application. Again, it's about knowing people out there, networking. We met a lot of great people today, and we're excited that we're gonna be, we were invited to go to Kienta to do the um, financial literacy program for the youth out there, uh, just making contacts out there. People say, well, we never heard of you. It's, it's, we're just a really small group of people. There's my sister and I and a couple of uh, people that work for us. You know, but again, we're trying to give back all of these projects and to our Navajo uh, people out there and the youth working with them. So I'm glad you brought out the cooperative and it can be done. You know, Again, Vichy um, Boss said, um, reach out to her organization. She represents the New Mexico Catalyst of Cooperative, and it will work. You know, again, it's just taking that next step, working with your leaders, work, get into, I'm hoping to get to the president one of these days. I'm hoping to meet with the, uh, the division director, Tony Skirlanis, 
who I went to school with at NAU, so I'm hoping that will be my foot into the door, but kind of give him some advice in terms of what I see that will make some difference for our Navajo entrepreneurs, which are farmer or ranchers, whether it's the youth out there making changes in their lending program, introducing more projects that have been done off the reservation and bringing those concepts here to our own Navajo entrepreneurs. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay, well, we have um, less than 15 minutes, well, 12 minutes left. We are going to, um, first of all, if you guys can all scan this QR code up here with your phone, there's a couple poll questions. We'd like to um, collect information from you all, so go in there and, and scan that and answer those questions. We're going to kind of do a speed round now here, so. <laughs> um, so the first question, I'm gonna start with Brett. Um, and I will give you four minutes, Brett. So the first question, or, or the next question is, uh, what creative ways can businesses access funding and how long should they plan to reach the goals of their company? So looking creatively, there, there are different options out there. there. There are now apps and platforms like, you know, for a while, Kickstarter was a thing where you would put your business up in people would invest, but now there are programs, I think one's called like Jumpstart, where you can go and pitch your business to a bunch of investors all at once, and they can all decide whether they wanna go like towards towards you. Um, the other is like, you know, I would say creatively, you, you kinda have to think outside the box again and tell your narrative. Everyone wants to be in on the next big thing or on the new thing. We all have ideas, but differentiating them between it is, really one of the big pieces. The one thing that takes time in all of these things is, you'd be surprised how many lawyers you get to meet when you're raising money, just how much back in paperwork that needs to get done. Really versing yourself, and there, there has to almost be an investment into this as well. You know, I was talking about that syndicate. We created loan documents. The loan documents probably cost us about $150,000 to make. So we spent $150,000 on attorneys to write like, you know, an agreement, some letter, um, they call them basically like side letters and some amendments and things. But that was, part of it was we had to learn the process, the lawyers had to learn the process. So a lot of that cost was the extra steps and the extra learnings that are required in doing business where we're doing it. We're all different, we all have different needs but that shows up in how long things can take. You know, right now we're in the middle of a capital raise currently, you know, our company is growing and we're gonna capitalize again. We're hoping, the last time we raised capital, it took us two years. So it took us two years from when we opened to when we finally closed the doors and said we're done, we can close up this thing and not it, and, and then we'll go on to the next thing. We're hoping to do this one within eight months. So we're boiling it down more simplified and we're raising a lot more capital than we raised the last time. We also have more options this time because we're a little more experienced and we're bringing in professionals. We can actually afford to hire, you know, the extra people we needed. That's another part too is like for the expertise, it's, it's really important that you value hiring really good accountants, really good attorneys. You're modeling your financial projections, your documents all have to be in order. It just helps alleviate everything. So all those pieces I would say are really important for, you know, the, 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 the raise and whatever it is you're doing to be effective. And then it also limits kind of the, um, the, the negotiations against you. That's the whole thing is you wanna be in the best place to get a good amount of capital at a very fair rate. But if you start getting into the risky territories, the interest levels go up, the amount of time goes up, like there's just so many things that start working against it. So preparation is very, very key to, to how you do any kind of capital raise. Okay, and for Sorvarsky, um, what can businesses do to prepare for a business loan? <laughs> Brett kind of answered most of that. <laughs> but yeah, just, just to reiterate what he was saying, um, just having a clear, being clear and concise about exactly what your objectives are going to be and putting it down all on paper. 
Beca I, um, and there's, you know, at Change Labs, we in the incubator program, we we help business owners with their business model canvas, which is like close to like what like what you would say a business plan would be, as well as um, teaching about you know what uh, projections are your business financial projections, and so you know when you're able to articulate all of this and you know really put down for. As a business owner, when you put everything down and you're able to tell someone or pitch exactly what your idea is going to be, it you know you are on the you you're, you're you 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 have that much you have more of that confidence to be able to accurately you know portray exactly what your plan is going to be, and so when you have everything written down, especially if you have plans and milestones that you're looking, you know, that you're planning on doing, you need to be able to articulate how you're gonna get to point A, point B, point C, and so, and, and like exactly how, you, and, all the, and all the resources that you're going to need to get there. And so a part of that is access to, cap there's lots, there's all these different resources he named, legal, you know, accounting. You, you need a whole group of people around you um, to help get you there too, and so financial advisors, like you know, depending on what your your plan is going to be and where you're wanting to take your business, having a clear plan and planning for the future is um, is is going to play a crucial role in that. And um, yes, so if, if it, and so um, if you if any of you are looking to start a business, have a business idea. There's there's a there's a whole team of us here that you can talk to, and we and you know we're here for that too. We're here to help guide you on what your first steps could need to be, depending on what kind of business you're trying to start. And so, um, don't be shy. <laughs> Definitely come up to one of us, and you know Brett has a wealth of knowledge. He's you know he's he's scaling his business pretty. You know it's 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 a great example of what Navajo can do. Um, yes. Okay, and for Lorenzo, as a Danette-owned business, how did you increase revenue and funding streams for your business on the Navajo Nation? Okay, first I look at my competitors. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna tell you a really, hopefully short story how we got started. Uh, like most of the individuals come back, from, uh, I work for the Navajo Nation Shopping Center, uh, CEO there. I turned it from a two million, four million to hold to a two million dollar profit within two years. Um, I actually just walked away one day, but that's another that's another story. So I was home and was like, "Oh, I've been just in school. I'm gonna take a couple months off." That didn't happen. A friend of mine heard that I wasn't working, so he contacted me. Have you done strategic planning before? I said, "Of course." And he goes, um, "Can you bid on this contract? So send us an invoice." So I did. And then so I got the job. He says, what's the name of your company? I'm like, okay. Um, I'm from Salina, Salina, business consulting service, I just said. So uh, there I was with a check. <laughs> I had no bank account, so I did things backwards. Uh, I finally opened an account online, like most banking on the Navajo Nation, Great West, not Great Western, but uh, Bank, of, Bank of America and Wells Fargo wouldn't give me an account even by then. I got my certificate. Um, so I had to go um, do it online. I had a BOA account, so I just added on a business account. I just got my EIN number, so that's how I, we opened, my sister and I opened our business. And never in a million years I thought, oh, I've been an entrepreneur. It just kind of was thrown at us. Then, by word of mouth, you know, we've been getting projects. Uh, so that's how we got started. Um, and eventually, um, we wanted to, we did the traditional, you know, business development, small business, financial, we not financial literacy, but we did the feasibility studies across the nation. We helped people do nonprofit. But I, we knew there was more there. We go into uh, any conference or workshop, the chapters would come to us. And then when we were writing our business plan, our target market would never include the chapters. So the chapters asked, can you help us with this? Can you help us with this? So I asked my sister, I was like, what do chapters do? You know, even I didn't know what they did. Uh, I just remember being a summer youth employee there, having making a couple of dollars an hour, but that was, to me, that was fun. So that my introduction to working with chapters, I saw an ad, a steamboat chapter, planner. Uh, I think it was like $15 an hour, which wasn't that much. So I, I was driving with my sister, I said, you know what? I said, I should apply for this. That way I can learn what chapters do. 
Uh, so long story short, I got a call from Flora Nez, chapter manager. She goes, Lorenzo, you have an interview. So I was like, I was all excited. So I got to my interview, and the first thing I said was, yes, I know I'm overqualified, but this is what I can do for you. I can help you get funding. I can apply for grants. I went down the list, you know, so I got the job as a part-time uh, planner for Steamboat Chapter. But I said, in return, you need to teach me what chapters do. So that's what she did. I worked for Steamboat Chapter, what's supposed to be a one-year project, uh, turned into four years full-time. And I had the time of my life, you know, people working with chapters. And again, I didn't know what a certified chapter was. I learned that whole concept, the whole you hear about AFOG, alternative form of government. We did that. We did the commissioner's uh, form of government for Steamboat. Um, we got, I got them in their first two grants from USDA. Again, it's with, again, you need to know and keep in contact with people that you meet at these conferences. I remember meeting Gary Mack from USDA. So I gave him a call in Arizona. I said, uh, Gary, uh, we're a certified chapter. This was what it means. You kind of have to educate them. By then I knew what a certified chapter was. They can get their own grants. They can get their own funding. So he went through his legal team and sure enough, they do qualify. So we got them uh, registered with the System for Awards Management. They call it SAMS. Very important to register because the, nowadays you cannot, no longer, there's no longer a uh, paper check. Everything gets uh, done electronically. So again, uh, we registered with them and then we got the first grant. So again, you can do a lot of projects with some of these grants. You can uh, do leadership development. I took them to the Reservation Economic Summit back then. We did a uh, community development business plan for them to start a project. So they, they, there's a lot of different opportunities out there, but that's how we diversify our services. We added chapters. As of today, I'm proud to say we have clients. Fort Defiance Chapter is our client. Chinle Chapter is our client. Tsapi Ken is our client. Tiso Chapter is our client out there. We did the community land use plan. They all got approved, five of them, by the RDC for the Navajo Nation. Again, look at what your competitors are doing and how you can do it even better. I'm not saying duplicate them. I'm not saying to plagiarize, but you know, grant writing, for example. People say, are you a grant writer? I said, not really. I just answered the questions, you know. Being in school, you do your research. So some of these questions, you know, you, you take those concepts from doing a research paper you do and for your thesis or dissertation, and that's the way we address it. We try to make it fun, but anyway. So that's how we diversify our revenues at that point for our for-profit. All right, well, we are at time, but thank you and have a good day.